so I'll be there again. Good to go. Okay, folks, um, good afternoon and thank you all for being here um, for the, the first of our Fam Trip Friday sessions of 2122. Um, I think anyone who participated last year um, really appreciated these sessions and it was a really good opportunity for us collectively to, to get to know each other and, and, and see the, the array of product that we do have across the district. So um, it's great to kickstart it again this year. Um, in terms of today's session, um, we have Barra Best here to host us, and I'll be passing over to Barra in, in a moment to take us through the session. Thank you for being here, Barra, and we will have um, Paddy Matthews, Head of Ireland's Hidden Heartlands, to give us some insights at the end of the session as well in terms of um, work that's, that's going on in terms of the Ireland's Hidden Heartlands brand. Um, delighted to have our local um, providers um, to present what they what they have and they're offering um, and share with you opportunities for collaboration and work that they've been doing. So we have um, Terry McCartney from Belmore Court and Motel, um, Mark Edwards and Skill and Taste Experience and John Paul Coyle who is Visitor Services Manager with um, Northern Ireland Museum Service and representing the Ulster American Folk Park. So thank you all for being here and um, we look forward to the, the session. Um, yes, I suppose I'm and I move on. I'm Karen McLernan and um, I'm Tourism Development Officer here at the Mananoma District Council. Um, I suppose just to remind us on the on the purpose of this webinar series, um, again for those of you who joined us last um, autumn winter and those who maybe haven't joined us before, the reason we started this was really to build knowledge of the tourism product across the district um, with, a, with an aim to strengthen partnerships and to enhance the visitor experience. Um, so that we as we as product providers are able to share that knowledge with our visitors when they're here with us um, and let them know what is on offer across the district to enhance their experience um, and ultimately to support your, your own business development. Um, and the third um, reason behind this is to forge connections between each other um, as a rural district and of course two rural destinations within that. It is important that we collaborate and work together um, in order to, to support our business development. So the purpose of this series is to allow us to, to learn more um, about what is on offer across the district and to, to meet the people behind that as well. In terms of um, <clears throat> just looking at last year compared to this year in terms of product and in terms of what is offer, on offer, um, from October 2020 there you can see until October 2021 um, you can see the increase in quite a number of different um, provision across the sectors. So in terms of accommodation um, we went from 304 to 347 registered um, with the with Tourism NI and um, accommodation providers that vary right across the, the board. Um, there's over 300 new food and drink providers and again they can be across the board from um, you know, maybe people who've moved into doing you know, private catering to um, new establishments to horse boxes, I'm sure. So there's quite a number of uh, food and drink providers that have come onto the horizon as well. There's been an increase of three activity providers, again showing that um, people are seeking the opportunities that are available there for the, the new domestic market and what they're seeking for within our district. And um, there's one new attraction in the form of Glen Park Estate um, in the, the Gorton area. And we now have six um, market ready experiences. And when I refer to market ready experiences, it's the Embrace Giant Spirit um, experiences. So we started last year with two, which would have been um, Blake Pottery and Island Discovery with our own water taxi. Um, this year we now have um, six, which are brand aligned. We have Mark here today um, within a skill and taste experience, which is a brand aligned experience. We have the Ulster American Folk Park. We have um, Delve Deep with the Marble Arch Caves, and we also have the Boat Charge Distillery Tour. Um, and in addition to that, folks, we are working with about another um, 14 to 20 providers, um, two of which will be market ready in the spring. They're progressing well on the Embrace the Giant Spirit process and on others that will join um, thereafter. So there's a lot of good work going on um, in terms of the experiences. In terms of marketing and reach and the work that Flamanda Lakeland Tourism have been doing representing both destinations Flamanda Lakelands and um, Omas Ferns, you can see the huge increase in terms of activity. Um, connecting with our digital platforms. So um, if you look at the unique visitors to both websites um, and the Facebook interactions of followers and people um, very clearly wanting to see what's happening in the base destination and what's on offer, there's been a huge uptake, um, which obviously for all of us as um, providers and operating in the sector means there's opportunity to, to reach those people and, and to um, I suppose attract them to our individual businesses when they're here. 
So that's just to give you a flavour in terms of what has um, happened over the last year. It's very high level and it's very broad, but it's just, again, when we're talking about getting to know the product and getting to know the providers behind it, um, you can see that um, there has been a huge increase and there, there's a lot there that we need to, to start uh, working and getting to know. So with that, folks, I'm going to hand you over to um, Bar Best, um, who's going to take us through um, our session in terms of guiding us through the speakers. Um, so Bara, welcome and thank you for being here. Look, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you. Um, it's just a pity I'm not in either Omar or Fermanagh, which I'm often in, um, but you may be delighted to know that uh, we never um, miss out either areas when we make new TV shows. And we have a new series coming out uh, in two weeks time, which will uh, feature both for Mana and Oma, and a few uh, good stories there. It's uh, it's uh, called Barra's Wild Days Out. It's not to be confused with Barra's Wild Night Outs in uh, <laughs> Um while staying at the Belmore Court Hotel. Um, I blame Terry personally on that. But, um, you know, it's it's great, and we always get great reaction um, whenever we do show uh, more local areas, especially uh, west of the van, and to showcase what's on offer there. Um, no stranger there to myself. Um, we did the Castle Arts deal. Uh, boat bikes things last last year. Um, well worth it, but make sure uh, you haven't gone to the gym before because you will have sore legs. It's worth doing. <laughs> it. um, but yeah, glad to be here with you today. Um, and the format basically, we're going to hear from a few people who are going to give uh, presentations. Um, and then you will have an opportunity to ask any questions if you have done so. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to figure out how to do that. Um, I think there's a feature with it. Raise your hand um, and put your questions to our contributors today. So. Uh, we'll get underway. Um, and first up uh, with the presentation, uh, it's uh, from Maniscal and Taste Experience. I'll hand over now to uh, Mark Edwards. Thanks, Barra. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Mark Edwards from Maniscal. I've been general manager of Blake's the Hollow for over 20 years now. But I suppose for today, um, we're talking about Maniscal and Taste Experience. I had this idea about four years ago of something that could, would really work on the island of Maniscal. And I suppose you're asking what it is. It's a, a walking food and drink tour on the island of Enniskillen, and that is the unique selling point of it. Uh, it being the only island town in Ireland, the amount of times we've said that recently. Um, but yes, I had this armchair, arm, armchair idea um, about three or four years ago, and I really thought it fitting to showcase Enniskillen um, through the local industry, really. Um, so how did it all start? I, I worked closely with the local business community. Um, and hand selected what I felt some of the very best award winning family run businesses in the town and area. And that was my platform to really present town and showcase it as a really diverse visit and destination for visitors and travellers alike. And I suppose from the visitor's point of view, the offering is diverse. It's an indulgent mix of food and drink. They're always um, guided by a warm from and a welcome. But I suppose over the journey of the, the tour, which takes about three and a half hours, um, really, um, guests really get a chance to experience the community spirit. Um, as I said, the businesses in the town centre is the heartbeat of the town centre and it's important, especially over the last couple of years. But not only that, they have a, a, an indulgent mix of food and drink. And guests, as I said, they are introduced to family run businesses and the real thing carries through out the tour. We meet father son combinations mother-daughter combinations and some of the businesses have been operating in the town centre for decades. So it's a testament to what they've been doing, to be honest. Um, the tour itself, just to give you a wee snippet of what it's about, I already said it starts and lasts about three and a half hours in the island of Enniskillen. Tours run every Saturday and they meet me at the iconic backdrop of the Enniskillen Castle. And to be honest, sometimes we really take that for granted. Um, I have visitors from all over the UK and further afield you know what a better way to start is at a castle where sometimes maybe we just walk by it and not even think of it from that approach but yes we start at the castle where hugh the hospitable maguire reigned in the 1400s and there is a few snippets of history food linked elements to the tour as well just add a little bit of depth to it as well so that people can really take away what they want as well as experience on the day as well and then guests stroll along the shores of Loch Garn, taking in this beautiful scenery before we make our way up in the town centre. And that's really where the tower begins in terms of food and drink and a culinary experience. Um, and for today, I'll just give you a highlight of maybe some of the stops we do incorporate. I've already said all family run businesses and no better to start the tour off is normally Joe, the baker or community 
Baker on the island. Um, for those that know him, he's a great character. He's become famous in his own right with his sourdough bread. But he pairs that off with Pat O'Doherty's famous Fermanagh Black Bacon. And again, it's all about the story for the guests. The local connection is where guests get most enjoyment out of it. And then we'd move guests on to the firehouse where Gavin and his team produce a lovely small plate of food, like a tapas style uh, plate. And again, we talk about probably one of the best ambassadors to Fermanagh, Joe McGurr and his boatyard distillery. And guests get a sample of his beautiful gin. With Pearl, um, she provides the stop for Tickly Moo ice cream, obviously sourced locally and made just out past the Manor House Hotel in Ogle Farm by the Gray family. And then I suppose a stop Dennis Gillen wouldn't be complete if you're sort of winding in and out of history to the 19th century butter market, which just is on the screenshot there. And honestly, the amount of guests that I have had out recently that are maybe not familiar with the town, um, but didn't even know the butter market was there. Um, and that's the enjoyment I get out of presenting the guests, the tour, the town and the tour and what it's all about. And then I suppose to stop, uh, Tennis Gill wouldn't be complete if we don't mention or enter the Victorian world of Blake's the Hollow, where we get to see the Game of Thrones door, um, sample some sausages from Shane Stewart, another family run business in the town, and a locally crafted beer as well. So overall, we finish off um, with a fine dining experience. Um, very from tour to tour, but we're delighted to have Glenn Wheeler on board. And for a, a walk and food and drink tour, um, to have a fine dining experience on it, 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 it really is quite special, to be honest. I'm delighted that we have so many businesses that have really embraced what our vision was from the start. But they've seen it now, it's up and running for the last um, couple of years, and the businesses have really seen what they're getting out of it. So there's a ripple effect for everybody. Obviously, there's the event and experience for the guest and the visitor. But that rolls out to the local community to the next visit when people come back to the town to spend money and the, the hoteliers and the accommodation obviously gets um, a ripple effect of it as well so overall it's very good for everybody the, sh the showcase of the town is easy it's all all here and i suppose from the end of, end of the tour guess really as i said see how diverse enniskillen is for a food destination and i think that's something that i really press through it's not just a town that um, people pass through to go somewhere else. Um, with the hard worker Tanya and her team in FLT and the likes of Karen as well, we're really putting Enniskillen on the map for a place to come and a destination to stay and enjoy for over a couple of days. So the tour is developed um, with the full premium tour on Saturday. Of visions, how's it going? There's the prompt there, thanks, Karen. Uh, where, where's it going to? The full premium tour. Um, Runs every Saturday, as I said, but a great vision um, towards, I suppose, this year, the last quarter of this year, which for reasons out of my control, I've sort of put back to next year. So the, the tour's going really well. It's sort of booked out probably two or three months in advance now through the website. Um, where's it going into 2022? I want to establish and get the tour up and running. And uh, I want to develop the experiences. So I'm going to take a step back contact some of the local businesses and I'd love and we have in the pipeline a few more experiences coming in 2022 um, pairing up with Barry and his boat and having a sort of land water experience which we'll work for and we hope to launch maybe in the springtime into the summertime Gin Island which will be a gin tour on the island of Enniskillen which will be the two points really for 2022 is to try to bring a bit of um, footfall into the town midweek um, and the skill on the weekends is quite busy and the Saturday tour is is growing successfully and organically there but I suppose the vision for 2022 is to try to bring footfall for the whole town and spend into the town centre midweek so that's what we're working towards next year. Thank you. Thanks so much Mark. In, in terms of feedback from um, the people you've had on your tours, uh, are you finding that they're enjoying the, the uniqueness of what you say is the island town and what's on offer there as well? Uh, absolutely. You know, I was really nervous for, um, at the start of who my customer was or would be. <clears throat> and it turned out it's sort of a mix between local Fermanagh people, Tyrone, uh, and people from the town. And I was really nervous about that, to be honest. And they, they've really enjoyed it. They've walked away. Um, reminded of how good the town is, how diverse the town is, how, how much potential is there in terms of food and drink. 
Um, and yes, they, they've they've really enjoyed the experience. The the visitor from outside, from Anna, that haven't really passed through the town or know the town, they're actually blown away from it. Mm. I suppose we've all encountered now um, with the experience. Oh, there's a talk through there. Um, yep. the As we move on to. Um, oh, so Someone just before we go, we have a very short video to play uh, of the experience okay. just to give you an insight. And hopefully, with our technical issues here, the sign will work on the video, but um, bear with us if it's not folks, all right? Um, thank you, Mark. And this is uh, what's your first name? Is it Declan? No, it's Danny Colton. Okay, Danny, if you leave that with me, and I won't be today, but I was just going to give you a call on Monday. Is that all right? Thank you very much. Good night. Right. Bye bye, Nick. There you go. Thank and, you. Um, Mark, one last word. Ticket available to purchase from? <laughs> yes, sorry. Yeah, tickets, <laughs> tickets available. Um, yes, tickets available. You can book through the Skill and Experience website. Um, but yes, just to finish off with Barra and Ask Me, I think it's important for us all to acknowledge, you know, the staycation theme and everybody's worked really hard to attract people to Fermanagh. And with, um, with the COVID restrictions opening up slightly behind, in the ROI market, um, we really seen great, great uh, surge of visitors for the first time into Fermanagh from the south. You know, it was only an hour's drive or less away from from wherever they're coming from. And you know, asked the question, Bar asked there. You know, the experience they had and felt, they thought the town was absolutely fantastic, beautiful, and friendly. So here's hoping to a, a stronger and full season in 2022. And thanks very much, Bar. Absolutely, and uh, here, here's hoping. Fingers crossed for you. And um, I have. Um, Completely optimistic at the will. Um, listen, uh, our next guest is today um, no stranger to many people. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, from the Belmore Court a Motel, uh, Terry McCartney. Over to you, Terry. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mara, and thank you for the opportunity, Karen, uh, and everybody for to explain what we do. Um, I, I don't look just quite as young as that photograph anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll we'll try this technology thing now. Uh, <laughs> you're happy enough, uh, Karen? Can you tell me? Yeah, yeah, we can see your screen there. Thank you, Karen. Okay, so there is a bit of sound. Mark's uh, didn't work, so I'm not sure whether mine work later uh, either. So we'll we'll run onto the first slide. Yes. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of flavour. Could you hear the sound or not? Uh, no, we couldn't. No, unfortunately. That's fine. I'll sing for the other ones. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so a little bit about the Balmore Court Hotel. We've uh, we've been here for quite a while now. With my father opening it in uh, 1989, uh, and then uh, I took over in 1995, uh, and then we built the new extension, which is the top picture on the left hand side, in 2008 just as the global economic crisis uh, took place. Uh, but we survived. We are the only four star motel on Ireland. And in fact, for years, we'll be the only motel uh, on the whole island. And then we got some imposters uh, over the other side of town, but we'll not talk about them on this uh, Zoom. Um, we have 60 bedrooms. Uh, luckily, during the pandemic, we had self-contained rooms. So we were able to uh, make use of those uh, for doctors, nurses, key workers, people with housing problems, oil spills, etc. Um, whereas we closed our um, newer building uh, and obviously we followed the staff, but it sort of helped us survive during that very difficult time. Uh, we have our superior executive rooms, 
and we provide a hot buffet breakfast in our new building. And we also have a sister property, which is our lodge at Lockern. Uh, one of the big things um, is our location. We are right on the edge of the island town of Inniskillen, as Mark just said. Uh, we are close to bars, restaurants, shopping attractions. And indeed, we work very closely with all of these guys and anybody on the call I, who wants to work with us, we, we can do so. Um, I must admit I've been on uh, Mark tour uh, on more than one occasion and it, it definitely blows you away. If you haven't done it yourself, even if you're from this area, you need to be going on it. Um, sustainability is obviously a big thing and it's going to become even bigger. We have uh, led the way in this for a number of years. Um, and uh, we, we are trying to stay there. We have three charging points now, which in the first, we had one for about seven years and one car used it, but now they're getting used, I would say probably at least one a month, uh, and that's only going to increase. Uh, we have 76 solar panels, and we have had that for a number of years. We're using your renewable energy, LED lighting, and obviously the local suppliers uh, were possible. Um, a little bit of uh, information about the rooms. Uh, and this just shows, uh, this is one of our most recent videos, which is which was um, we used with the help of Mananoma District Council, showing some of the highlights. Um, these are our standard rooms. The great thing about the standard rooms, they are with their own front door. They come and go as you please. And uh, they have USB C sockets, which are the new thing now. Um, independence. Gourmet Brothers obviously going to be plugged there, but it's a, it's a case of coming down, making something in your little kitchen or going out for dinner. The workcation seems to be the thing now. We're getting a few people that are coming, not just for holidays, uh, but people coming down to do a little bit of work while in, they're in this part of the world and trying to double up uh, a wee bit of relaxation time and a bit of work time. And these are larger family units, the quad rooms. Well, oh, there we just. OK, so with the standard rooms, they have a kitchenette. Um, it's a basic kitchenette that will make you, it'll allow you to, to uh, make light meals. Uh, you're not going to make a Christmas dinner there. We have had people try, <laughs> believe you me. Uh, microwave, fridge uh, and the sort of oven with two ring cooker. Uh, we have introduced uh, two and a half years ago pet friendly rooms. Uh, these have proved extremely popular. And uh, they, we find even dogs are looking for us on the internet, which is fantastic. <laughs> and when they find us, uh, they're very, very excited. So that's, if you want to bring your pet to Kermana, we are interested in other uh, pet friendly attractions and restaurants, etc. So we can add you to our website. Uh, superior rooms are in the new rooms. Uh, these are more hotel like um, in terms of their layout. They have uh, double twin quad rooms. We have large TVs, smart TVs, the charging facilities. Uh, some of them are even on the, on the top floor with balconies, um, which is great for smokers. There are still quite a few smokers out there, so to, to save them smoking in the room or coming out so they can go out onto the balcony. Executive rooms, executive rooms slightly bigger, different uh, layout um, in terms of the size. They have uh, a nice sofa to relax on as well as this one actually has a bath TV, so you could sit in the bath and you could watch uh, the weather with Barra Best at any time um, because it's on pause or on loop. <laughs> um, and then on the top corners with two executive suites, these are much bigger um, and have uh, just two, two separate rooms, one for working in and one for relaxing in. Um, Whenever we started, uh, we tried to stay away from breakfast and we served a continental breakfast. Uh, and while I would have loved to maintain that, the customer said, no, they want um, a cooked breakfast. So we have gone more and more down the cooked line using the local produce uh, that, you, that you see detailed here. So it's a hot buffet breakfast uh, and we're all always improving it. And we have a food hygiene rest rating of five. Uh, a little bit about then our lodge at Loch Earn. Uh, a number of years ago, we got the opportunity to purchase one of these. Um, it is three bedroomed, will sleep eight people. Uh, and of course, it's overlooking the fantastic Loch Earn Resort in, in Fermanagh. We 
initially bought it thinking it would do golfers, uh, but actually it ends up doing more wedding people and leisure people uh, with some golfers. And uh, it's it's worked really well for us. Uh, one of the things uh, about uh, the Belmore Cup Motel is the uh, reviews and we do monitor these and uh, try and uh, keep an eye on trends and any and any uh, surveys that we see to see if there's anything going wrong, anything going right. Uh, and thankfully we've been able to consistently be number one TripAdvisor uh, in the area. So more recently we've uh, added an app uh, just before lockdown just to help people get the information uh, they want before they get here. We have added um, pre check ins and prepays so people can check in online and people can pay online even before they get here. Uh, that obviously makes it a bit safer for them with COVID, but it also reduces our burden on reception. Uh, there's lots of room guides, etc. on it. We've also added uh, a press reader app. We used to spend quite a lot of money on um, newspapers uh, at the front desk. Now, if you stay and you use our Wi-Fi, you can use the press reader app and download, I think it's 7,000 magazines and newspapers uh, on a daily basis and take them with you. Um, that's really all I have. Um, I had a, a little video at the end, uh, but uh, it was um, uh, the last time Barra stayed here. Um, but what I'll do is I will uh, leave the link uh, for you to watch because you can't get the sound. You need the sound. That's me, guys. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Terry. Yeah, I mean, as you managed, mentioned there, um, a lot of people were using the space so your hotels there for a business as we did. Uh, in the past few months for doing a bit of filament. Um, we've stayed there before, but um, those, well, we all know that COVID had a big knock on effect in hospitality and tourism, but staycations then became a bit of the lifeblood. Was that something you found as well? Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, we have gone from having the worst uh, run in our history to having the best run in our history. Um, and while it's been uh, really busy, um, that's not always a good thing because of the challenges that COVID presented in terms of the logistics, uh, the supplies, and uh, most importantly, the staff, because, um, well, I mean, I don't need to rehearse the, the, the reasons for that, but it's uh, it's been extremely difficult and extremely difficult on all the staff who are doing, well, they may have had a number of months off, but they definitely came back and did twice as much as work as, the, as they thought they were going to do. So uh, and we're, we have a great team here, thankfully, and it's looking after them is key for me. Well, hopefully as uh, travel continues to open up, international travel uh, included, that, that that will come alongside staycations so that uh, the tourism offering for Mananoma will just continue to thrive. Hopefully that, that will be the case as well. Yeah. Yeah. Super happy to take any questions now or later. OK, well, look, um, Terry, we'll go on to the next uh, interview, our next contributor before we do the questions. Um, and it's from the Northern Ireland Museums at the Ulster American Folk Park. And I'll hand over now to uh, John Paul Coyle. John. Thanks, Para. Um, just to give a wee uh, caveat, we're National Museums and I, we're not the Museums Councils. <laughs> For NMNI, just to make sure, because it's being recorded, that um, our our um, management team will be much more content. But yeah, thanks very much. Unfortunately, I had a bit of tech problem, so I'm going to have to share my screen. Um, it's a very simple little um, presentation I've got for you, so it's nothing too um, laborious. But yeah, thanks very much for for asking me to actually um, talk to you guys today. Um, Tourism for the Ulster, for National Museums and for the Ulster American Folk Park within a COVID-19 world has literally turned our product and our experience upside down. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah, you're good. Brilliant. Has turned our experience upside down. So we would have been, as you'd all know, we're one of the biggest tourism providers in the West of the Ban. Um, very popular with coach operators, um, travel trade. Um, independent travel and then of course like you've just got your you know walk-ups of families and then our school programs with COVID everything's changed and um, the park closed unfortunately um, after Halloween in 2020, uh, 2020 and didn't get to reopen until May um, 2021 which came with a lot of difficulties so COVID-19 has changed how we operate um, the past is the past which is kind of important when you're a museum um, if you're not familiar, the Ulster American Folk Park tells the story of 
Irish emigration or emigration from Ulster um, during the 18th and 19th centuries to the New World, which was Canada and America, um, utilising our museum exhibit space and then our outdoor exhibits, which is a, a mixture of original and um, replica buildings um, representing both the old world and the new world. So it's, you know, the famous thatch cottage is the Mellon House, which is the one original building on the site. Um, Ulster Street, the replica of the Union Bridge to take you to America and then the journey through that. But we had to change everything because the Folk Park, as you know, was a place that people would stop when they're travelling up to Donegal, going up to the, you know, Bundoran, say, or they're going to Balik, or they're going to the Fermanagh Lakelands. They would have stopped off at the Folk Park, had a tour, had a bit of lunch and then continued the journey. That all had to stop because we couldn't just have an open door policy. So when we got to reopen in summer 2020, we had to introduce um, pre-book. So all of a sudden our free flow experience ended. So we had to actually operate within our capacities. And at the start, they were very limited. Um, we couldn't actually have any more than 30 people in a group um, in a, at any one time. And the tours went every 30 minutes. So we had to retrain our staff. We had to actually retrain our customers as well. Um, our travel trade just plummeted. We literally lost everything overnight and slowly but surely we're trying to rebuild that and for an organization that you know is so seasonal um, your tour operators keep you going through early spring um, early summer until really our mass market which is you know june july august to mid-september it's, it's been a huge loss then we had to operate within the guidelines so we had to actually operate within covid um government guidelines and the difficulty for us is that we're an arm's length body so we are a charity um national museums and i is a charity but we are funded by central government, but we're not central government. But because we're within that sort of gray area, being an arm's length body, we have to operate rigidly to government rules because we're seen as a government agency, although we're not. So we really had to operate very strictly within our COVID rules. But also we had to ensure that our public and our staff um, were getting the best experience possible. One of the things about our staff is that we have a very well established team, but also we have a, a more mature um, staffing level. So we had to be very conscious of their safety and well-being as well as their customers. So there was a lot of confidence building. Um, we've had actually the buildings we could operate. Uh, so we needed to have two doors. So the houses that only have one door is only one family is allowed in. The houses that have two doors, we can have a guide inside it. So the Mellon House thankfully had two doors. Uh, the school has two doors and good, you know, um, flow through the ship gallery and so on and so forth. So we had to box clever in the experiences and for everybody, what happened before can no longer apply. So you can no longer say, but we used to. Um, what we used to do no longer counts. You know, you have to go by the regulations and we've had to stick rigidly to the regulations and customer feedback and sentiment. So how we've done that um, was to create a consistent message. We've worked with the statutory agency, so Public Health Authority and Fermanagh and Oma District Council. We've also worked with Tourism and I to achieve our good to go rating. Um, We've had a lot of um, cross working groups, so we've had groups for everything you can imagine, and we operate sort of a, on a sister basis. So we have the Ulster American Folk Park here in Oma, then we have the Ulster Folk Museum and the Ulster Transport Museum in Coltra, and then we have the Ulster Museum. So we've grouped ourselves into two uh, sort of teams, the outdoor museums, so that's the Folk Museum and the Folk Park, and then our indoor museums, which is the Transport Museum and the Ulster Museum. And we've had to adapt and change our customer flows um, our touching strategies and the overall experience that we're still ensuring our customers are safe. They're having a, a very safe and enjoyable experience, but at the same time, they still haven't lose, lost the magic of the faux park. So we still let our customers taste the food. Um, we still do our bacon demonstrations. We still have our apple butter and our pancakes and all the things that we're famous for. The advantage has been we've been operating within the COVID regs, which means we can do it safely. Another very important agency that we've worked with throughout this is ALVA. So that's the Association of Leading Visitor Attractions. And we've used their audience insights and sentiments to actually really feed into what we're doing. So we have um, barometers of scores that we, we operate to, and we like to operate above or higher than the nominal rates that ALVA set. So we, we've actually pretty much exceeded all the targets that Elvis set. And then of course, we've got our um, five-star rating with Tourism and I. The other thing was the cross-working groups. So that's from everybody from our facilities teams, our gardeners, um, our front of house, 
our visitor guides, right up to senior management team. We've had all these cross working groups to ensure that we could actually get to open. And then finally, training and consistent messaging. It's been a great experience. I don't know how you felt, but it's been a great opportunity to actually retrain staff, uh, look at uh, service and standards, um, our own internal um, sentiments as well, and actually get our staff the time to research and to learn. So it's been sort of a win-win in that sense. But messaging has been the real key for us, um, and that's ensuring uh, consumer confidence. We spent a lot of time in new routes, so the whole park used to be a free flow that you arrived and you know you could just do what you liked. You could visit the blacksmiths and you maybe go to the school and then you could nip up to the um, Mellon House. We've now got actually a whole new route network that was all worked out with social distancing, ensuring the customers are still getting a good chance to enjoy the product. Um, you know, we had our points off our PPE for hand sanitization. Um, and so we created these new routes and actually in fact we're going to keep the one way route because it's been so successful. The other great success from these messages and build consumer confidence is with the pre booking. We can now actually flow our customers throughout the day. So over Halloween we had 1200 people a day. Um, but the advantage of pre booking was that they actually were 1200 over the entirety of the day. So from 10 o'clock in the morning until uh, 4 30 p.m. So all of us, we didn't have the pinch points where you had 800 people arriving between 12 and 2. They arrived consistently throughout the day, so they get more time with the guides and they get a far better experience and a much more hands on experience, even though technically it isn't hands on because of COVID, but it's a much more hands on experience. Um, we've introduced PPI for staff and for cleansing stations. One big thing that you would never have seen in tourism was the cleaning team. You know, cleaning was always done before you opened the doors to the public and now it's the complete reverse. We have our cleaners constantly cleaning throughout the day to gain build that consumer confidence and to give our customers um, confidence to know that we're actually taking their safety and our staff safety very seriously. So now our cleaners are the star of the show and they're very much in the public forefront. Our message has been very important be that through our website and our social media. And then again, our branding has been important. So we have a language uh, for the folk park. So it's been very much the, the sort of the howdy folks and with their COVID messaging. So it's much more light and fun and to allow people to buy in. And then finally, our, confident, um, our confidence and customer sentiment has been really important. And that is to allow our, our staff to buy into it. So they've got the confidence to grow with their capacity increases. And we've been using customer sentiment and feedback to actually grow our capacities as well. So we've gone from 30 and we're now sitting at 105 every 30 minutes. Um, and that's because we're following the guidelines set by government, but also the guide, the, the sentiment from our customers to know that they feel safe and our staff feel safe. And we review that every three weeks as well. Now I'm going to close this wee screen. Um, that was a wee bit of a whistle stop, but uh, I'm going to close this screen. And I have one more thing to share with you, if it'll work. Hopefully you can hear this. Oh, sorry about that. Isn't it great when you're rubbish at technology? So I'm going to share this. Why is that not working? Sorry about this, everybody. I'm having major text. OK, so this is our video that we produced and hopefully you can hear it. And this is what we produced for our reopening. Can everybody see us OK? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Yeah, there's just no sound. I'll not play at all, but that was just to give you a sense of the messaging that we've created um, to give that customer, um, you know, confidence and that the new, you know, what we were doing was the safe thing. So that's really a whistle stop tour of the Ulster American Folk Park and uh, how we got through through COVID with good, you know, consumer confidence and growth. As I say, we were able to do our Halloween event there where you know, last year we, we, we were unable to do it and this year because we've been following the guidelines and being really, really strict with what we're doing, we were able to have a, you know, a nine day event 
with just under 10,000 people at that. And we had our three evenings with just under two and a half thousand people, all flowing through within time slots, all following health and safety guidelines and the COVID guidelines. And people had a really good experience. And we're confident and please God that, you know, things don't change, that we're going to be able to do our Santa experience as planned and have Father Christmas in the wagon shed once again, uh, bringing good Christmas joy to everybody in the in the area. So it's it's been tough, but it's been good. And, you know, it's been a, it's been a big journey for everybody, including the staff, um, management and our public, because we've just literally had to rewire the business in what, what might have been five years of change. We've had to introduce it in a year. So it's been a huge, you know, paradigm for us and just changing the operations completely on its head. But it's been good and we've got there. Good stuff. I mean, as you say, you took a real hammering over COVID, but you've kind of built on the disadvantages of COVID and built something new, a new experience, the one-way system yeah. of being able to release those pinch points, as you said. So take advantage of a bad situation, I suppose you could say. Absolutely. It's the only way to do it. You know, it's like the pre-booking, something we would never have had. And now we don't want to lose it because we've got a really good insight into like our, our um, consumer trends and our numbers. So like we can actually prepare a better bit, you know, increase the staff levels for the cafe. They can, you know, order more food and more stock. So you've kind of got a better control of, of, of your flows and what you're doing. And then with the tour operators as well, they're coming back. Thankfully, um, the Americans are really confident. So, I mean, they're not there, but they're tour operators and we're talking about 23, 24 and they're now talking about 22, 23. So I have a good feeling that next year we should hopefully get our North Americans back. Um, if everything goes to plan with all of the Europeans coming over to America, it doesn't put them off too much. Um, so, yeah, you know, we're confident um, things are never going to be the same. Numbers might not be the same for a number of years, but you just have to ride that wave and, and hope for the best. Yeah, well, fingers crossed. Well, uh, look, thanks very much for that, John Paul. And just before no we bring our, our guest speaker, um, just a, a chance to give any, uh, ask any questions that anybody has up to this point to any of our speakers. Um, so I think there's a method that you could raise your hand using one of the options. So um, maybe Karen can see if there's any questions sent in um, that we need to, anybody wants to put. Um, I don't see any hands up for questions at the moment, but I know there'll be a brave soul somewhere. Along the way. Yeah. Well, Tanya or Terry. OK, hold on. We have some hands up. This is great. Um, we'll go to Tanya first um, and then we'll come to you next, Terry. So Tanya. No, just going to say, you know, thanks very much to the three that have presented so far. Um, even though we in FLT supposedly know your product, you always see something new and it's always good to sort of be refreshed and reminded of things. Um, I was, I mean, it's very obvious, obviously, from from what Mark does, how he works with the other providers, because that's all part of your offering. I'd be interested to see Terry, because I know, especially on your marketing platforms, you very much utilize selling the destination to sell the Belmore Court and any of the offers that you have. If you're talking about autumn, you very much focus in on what's available now, you know, the stairway to heaven, the pottery, the castle, and you mention all of that, you know, um, when you're promoting the Belmore Court. So it was just a, you know, is there anybody else that you would like sort of to be working with or just to give people, you know, the ideas of, you know, you mentioned before, maybe you'd be happy to work with people, but just that whole importance of, you know, using the destination and using the experiences to sell your offering, if you wanted to elaborate a bit more on that. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. Um, yeah, listen, uh, about a third of our business is repeat business um, and we're happy with that. Now, they're not all coming back just to stay at the Belmore Court. They're coming back because what Fermanagh has to offer. Now, what we do and we do try and work with FLT in a partnership approach and anybody else that's willing to do that, whether I mean, because we have no bar and restaurant, we work very closely with um, the Westville and the Firehouse, etc. because our guest would book a dinner package and they could stay here and eat over there. Uh, but by all means, whether what, whatever attraction or experience it is, we are happy to work with. Now, on saying that, and obviously I sit on the tours board um, and they have a lot of different um, marketing segments. We find that our customer is extremely independent and we've tried to package 
you know, two or three night stays where they have to, where they go to an attraction, they have dinner, and on the whole, they mm-hmm. don't work as well as just somebody booking an overnight stay. But that's not to say that people, when they arrive here or before they come here, are contacting our reception uh, to see what's happening. And in fact, we were our reception team were lucky enough to get an invitation to. Uh, there's a new ice rink actually uh, <laughs> just at Share Centre, and so some of our reception team took the plunge uh, and went out to it. And again, from from that that's point of view, now they're able to tell people that stay with us. Listen, did you know there is a, a an ice rink at Share Centre? We've been there, and that's worked extremely well for us, Tanya. In that in that sort of partnership approach. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting thing to say, Terry, because I think all of us have been focused maybe over a number of years about packaging things up. But I think more and more, it's more a case of how best can you tell the visitor either before they come or when they come, what is there available for people while they're here, as opposed to trying to do it for them, because that's maybe not the way people want things anymore yeah i mean we, we are we're still segmenting uh, but i mean what when we send an email out uh, to families we i want images or video from from Anna fun farm for exactly to let mm. them know that this is a new attraction you can do this if it's going yeah. to adults maybe then it's more like experience in a skilling but again it's not just a sell 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 it's a sell destination come to from Anna, it's, if we can make the pie bigger it's better for everyone and we, we listen. We appreciate again, like Mark said, the work you guys are doing in FLT. Um, and I suppose that brings me on to my question. And, and either you or, or, or Karen can help me. Whenever Karen put up her slide, it showed that Explore Oma Spern's website had increased to hundreds of thousands. Yeah, is that all because of John Paul? We were. Yeah. <laughs> We, I, I questioned that as well, Terry, I can assure you, but we did, we were working with a company called Digital 24. And I think for that particular month, I think it was when a lot of that work was being done. And obviously we were starting from a much lower base, but that was some paid for um, um, social media advertising that was being done. And that's the results that we got out of it. So, um, yeah, we did question that as well, as well ourselves. <laughs> but I suppose but it was yes, probably a, what they call a perfect true. storm, yeah. wasn't it? I mean, between, you know, the what the consumer wanted in terms of what the Sparrows offer and the, the campaign that you were running, Tanya, you and know, I think, combining yeah, to give those Halloween results. And so. everything, probably everything that's been going on, I would say at the Folk Park as well. And, you know, the comparison of, of the same period last year when things weren't maybe open up as much. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and but also yes. the new product on the ground as well. Do you know what I mean? That is driving interest in that area as well. So yeah. There's, yeah. And and I think and I think guys, and this is for everybody. That call, I mean, the more we can extend the season, the better it is for everybody. And I know that the caves have opened more, as we mentioned, the share center. Wh- whatever, if there's attractions happening in in November and December, January, February, if if we don't know about them and don't expect the, you know that I'm in social media all the time looking for. Them, the attractions and the experiences need to be contacting the hotels, the guest houses to let people know that this is happening. That's yeah. vitally important. And folks, if you, if anybody that's online, if you want to send that information even through to us, we'll make sure that that gets out to the trade. I think we already sent an e-zine a few weeks ago to let people know what was happening for autumn, Halloween and any Christmas events. So, but we're quite happy to update that on a regular basis. So just feed the information through to FLT and we will share that with everyone. And Karen, I must apologise uh, to Paddy. He had to sit through my presentation, but I have to go. Unfortunately, I have to drive to Bangor. <laughs> so sorry, Paddy, but thank you. Uh, well, I'm sure um, we will we'll share all the presentations with everyone afterwards. So the recording will be made available, but also I know that um, Across the board, we all had technical issues, so maybe the sound wasn't available. But if the pres- presenters are content, we'll share the videos as well um, in, a, in a you know post session email so that people can reference them um, and use if, if it's suitable. All right. So unless we've any more folks um, questions, we might far we can move on then. And thank okay. you, Terry, and safe travels. Thanks very much, Terry. And yes, okay. We'll hand over to. Um, 
our guest speaker today from Ireland's Hidden Heartlands. Uh, over to uh, Paddy Matthews. Paddy. Thanks, Barra. Um, I, I just share my screen here. Um, just got a, got a few slides. Probably got far too many, but I'll boot through them, so won't um, won't kill you with, um, with, with with PowerPoint. But um, look, there's, it's it's um, it's a given probably that we have a huge amount in common um, in terms of uh, Permana and what you offer there and what we offer in in, in Hidden Heartlands. And uh, there's a lot of commonality, um, a lot of connectivity as well. I mean, if we look at the Shannon Earn. Um, and, and the Aaron system, they're they're very connected there. We've got the Bear Breffney Way, which is a uh, is a very long walkway from uh, Bear Island um, or from Dursey Island, actually in Cork, right up the Black Line. But then it continues also and, and joins up, I think, with with, with the Ulster Way as well, um, and also the Quilca Lakeland Geopark, um, which up until recently I think was was the Marble Arch Caves Geopark. Uh, Ireland's Zoni cross border geopark. Uh, so there's lots that that unites us and and um, and uh, joins us. And I, I think that we have a lot in common in terms of the the nature of our offering and what it is that uh, the experiences that that are that are on the ground as well. And um, I just bring you through a kind of a whistle stop tour of what some of those are in in Hidden Heartlands, and you'll probably see quite a lot. You know that you've got of of similar similar type of offering and similar type of experiences as well. So um, what, what I'm just going to bring you through, because the Hidden Heartlands is, is quite a young brand. It's only three years old um, and for half of its life it's been in in um, in COVID. So it, it, it was only getting going really and getting out of the blocks when COVID hit. It was launched um, in April 2018, uh, but myself and the team weren't in place until September uh, 2018. So it was, it was really only then that we that we got going and um, uh, you know, less than a year and a half later than COVID hit and uh, for the last year and a half we've been operating within COVID with some really um, surprising results as well. Um, we've had a, cop a captive domestic audience for the last two seasons and, uh, you know, having that ha has its upsides because people have to take holidays at home and they've been rediscovering places or discovering places for the first time in many instances that uh, they hadn't, that they wouldn't have considered before. So when Fortaventura or Villamora or any of these places aren't open to them, uh, when they have to stay at home, they go off the beaten track and maybe to discover other places. And we've been, we, we've had the opportunity over the last couple of years to introduce the region to a domestic visitor that wouldn't otherwise have considered it as a first choice. But now that they've been introduced to it and have experienced it, they seem to have had a very good time in what they're telling us anyway. And the uh, the prospects for a repeat visit are very high as well. So the challenge facing us over the next few years now is can we convert those first time visitors over the last few years into loyal repeat visitors in the years to come? Um, can you can can you see that screen? Is that is is, is that visible? Yeah, I'll just put it yeah. on. Um, I'll, I'll put it on. Yep. Uh, yeah, that, that's probably better now. So, um, so the the geography itself um, is the middle of Ireland. It's the kind of the hole in, in in the donut, as it might have been referred to previously. Um, and it's the fourth experience brand that we've developed in in Fauci, Ireland. The first was um, the Wild Atlantic Way back in around two thousand and fourteen. It was launched. Then Ireland's Ancient East came about. Um, a couple of years later, of course, well, once we had Wild Atlantic Way done, every part of the country wanted it. It's its, its own experience brand. So Ireland's Age East came next. Uh, Dublin was always there, but it was rebranded shortly afterwards uh, as well with um, Surprising by Nature um, brand. And then uh, three years ago, we launched um, Ireland's Hidden Heartlands as well as a reimagining of, of the Midlands of Ireland. Um, we have a relatively low market share, so in terms of, 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 of the, the share of visitors to the to the Republic generally, uh, Hidden Heartlands would have four to five percent, and that's of, inter, of domestic visitors and international visitors, so a relatively low uh, market share. Um, and a, a region that, while it's very accessible, it, it's got these radial routes that emanate from, from Dublin, um, M3, M4, M5, M6 and M7. Uh, and M8 as well. Uh, while, while we have those routes going through the region, um, it makes the region as permeable as a tea bag in many ways because it's while access is very good into it, 
egress is equally good. So it tends to be the area that people pass through on their way um, to the west for, for, their, for their holidays. And that's what it's traditionally been. So the challenge for us is to, is to, re, is, is to um, uh, re, reimagine the area and um, position it as, 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 as something distinctive that's distinctive from both uh, hidden heartlands, and, or sorry, from both ancient East and uh, wild Atlantic Way, and start to grow awareness of the region and to build it, build believability and credibility uh, among visitors uh, of the region as a, you know, as a place to have a, a great holiday. Um, just lo lo looking at some of the uh, at our overall proposition, so there's a brand proposition that, that that sits beneath the logo, obviously, that is the kind of promise to visitors. So what's a brand? It's it's a promise that you make to your guests. It's a promise that you make to your visitors, and we want to try and live up to that in in as in in, in as um in as, as real a way as possible. It boils down to being being active in nature and having all these hidden gems that are in the area that are yours to uncover. So it's it, it's based upon a kind of a very outdoor offering. Um, by and large, that's not to ignore the many cultural um, indoor gems that are that are there as well. Uh, they're very much part of the offering. But if if we're to distinguish ourselves, you know, from Ireland's Age East, for example, and also from from Wild Atlantic Way, it's it's about kind of a very. Uh, it's almost like Ireland's decompression chamber, you know, the, the kind of chill out zone, an area where you can really get away from it all, uh, reconnect with family and friends, um, and get out outdoors and into the fresh air um, and positioning ourselves as a kind of an ecotourism or a sustainable tourism destination is very important as well. That proposition is kind of stood up by the uh, what we call the signature assets and the signature experiences. So the assets that we have that are you know, not not unique, but we have we we have a high density of obviously obviously the River Shannon and the Shannon and Aaron Waterway is unique to to Hidden Heartlands, and that goes down the spine of the region. So that and the Bear Breffney Way, um, which are uh, uh, the two of those almost form a double spine within the region. We've we've bogs, boglands, uh, wetlands, and woodlands, and there's a big debate around the bogs at the moment. There's a just transition. Um, fund and a just transition initiative, what they call from brown to green. So we've spent so many decades now um, cut, cutting away the bogs, uh, burning them for fuel and for energy. Um, now that that's stopping uh, due to the need to cut down our carbon emissions and it's the right thing to do, a lot of those boglands are now being rewilded and, and re-wetted and we're looking for alternative um, uses for them and tourism is one of the one of the uses that's been looked to. So there are huge opportunities there in, in some parts of the heartlands. We, we, we seem to have a lot of these lake island castles and it was mentioned earlier that you know the only lake lake uh, the only island town in in, in the in, in the country in, in the in, on, on the island of Ireland is um is Enniskillen which was which, which was news to me uh, that, that that's great to know and that's a real USP for 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 Enniskillen and one that you you should really push. We we have these other little uh, lake island castles and monasteries as well scattered throughout uh, the the Shannon system in, in particular that we that we put in the shop window for for the for the brand as well. Uh, these picturesque waterside towns and villages, hidden heritage gems in their stories, and lakeside lodges and woodland cabins, you know, which are which are very kind of on brand as well. So the the, the experiences that they kind of translate into are, I mean, cruising on the Shannon is are probably our single iconic um, experience that. Uh, Tourism Ireland, for example, would you know if, if you're saying well, what in Hidden Heartlands would be in the window of tours or the shop window for Tourism Ireland? Cruising on the Shannon would be the obvious one. And um, just getting active in nature with walking on water-based experiences is important as well. Outdoor family fun and adventure. Uh, we've we've the biggest uh, inflatable water park in the country. In um, it's got a world record for I think it might have been beaten last year, but it had the, had the world record for the world uh, the the highest inflatable. Um, slide uh, on Loch Ree just outside that loan called Baseports. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of ecotourism experiences as well and this was the, the ecotourism, the, the, the legacy of, of an initiative like the Green Box from about 10-12 years ago is, is, is still there and something that we can build on again I think and that again that Green Box initiative was cross-border initially and um, uh, and I think that's something that we can that we can build on also, um, and then just uncovering hid, hidden gems, etc. So just, just just some of the, the the kind of experiences we have. Top left there is Arigna Mines in in Roscommon, overlooking Loch Allen, and uh, there's a whole slow adventure 
network of businesses in Leitrim. Um, bottom left there, you, you, it's, it's part of the Geopark. Um, it's um, um, Clock Uther Castle in Loch Uther, which is part of the, um, the kind of round Drumlin landscape there, um, just outside Kilishandra in County Cavan. Um, and uh, Clonalis House there in Roscommon as well, uh, which, which is one of our real hidden hidden cultural gems. Uh, we were we were at the opening about a month ago, actually, or three weeks ago, of the newest distillery uh, that we have in the Hidden Heartlands as well. I, I, I probably a lot of you have tasted it, uh, gunpowder gin at this stage. They've also got sausage tree vodka and drum shambo whiskey, um, fantastic spirits. Uh, but they've opened a, a three and a half million euro um, with, with no public funding at all uh, visitor centre, which is second to none. It's uh, really well worth the visit in Drumshambo, outside Carrick and Shannon, an area that wouldn't have been a traditional tourism hotspot, but it, they're really putting it on the on, on the map now. And great to hear, you know, about the Anna Skill and Taste experience earlier on. Um, we were own little uh, collection of of um, providers as well, food providers, uh, like the Clock and Farm in in Longford. Um, the newest, uh, the actually the first microbrewery, I think, to open west of the Shannon in, in probably 100 years was Dead Centre Brewing in um, in Atlone. Um, and, and then a host of kind of outdoor activity providers as well, like Mid Ireland Adventure down in Banagher and Offaly, and uh, Celtic Roots Studio, who um, kind of tap into the bogs. They do bog oak sculpting and bog oak uh, jewellery making there as well. Helen Keneally in uh, Celtic Roots Studio. Um, you know, others are uh, down in Loch Derg. Um, down in, in, in the southern part of the geography, you've got the likes of McKern and Woolen, Woolen Mills, um, Brookfield Farm, who do their own honey, Wild Irish Chocolates, fantastic chocolate, um, and Killaloo River Cruises, all down around Loch Derg. There's a real, real tight cluster of businesses that have been doing very well down there. And um, so some new investment as well. Um, Falch Ireland ourselves have just put 3.9 million into the National Famine Museum in Strokestown Park um, in County Roscommon. And uh, there, there's a new visitor centre being built there for the for the museum, and um, it's a it, it's a great little hidden gem. Only about thirty thousand visitors at the moment. We're hoping to raise it up to maybe sixty, seventy thousand visitors a year. Um, and it's it's on the N5 between Dublin and Westport, and it tends to be a little bit of a T and a P stop at the moment for buses that are that are you know tour groups that are going from Dublin over to the west. But we want to try and establish it as a destination in its own right that can begin to drive um, overnights and uh, um, in the wider region as well. And, and that's one of our challenges. This is another piece of investment, uh, nearly five million uh, just announced by us recently in the Shannon Pot Discovery Centre um, and the Cavan Burren. So these are again part of the geopark, literally an acid roar from the stairway to heaven um, and from the Marble Arch Caves. And I think that that geopark has, has an area that, that's got real potential. And um, so what we're trying to do is, I mean, you guys on, 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 on the Fermanagh side have are, are, are certainly ahead of us um, in um, packaging up and delivering the visitor experiences that are there. You've got great visitor numbers in, in into both uh, both of those attractions that I mentioned. So we're trying to balance it up now and, and provide collectively a much uh, more compelling um, uh, visitor experience as a whole. So we're putting money into the Shannon Pot um, and also uh, that, that elevated walkway is part of the, is, is an idea for uh, a new experience in the Cavan Burren which is only like five kilometres. So they're both, they're about five kilometres apart, uh, those two attractions. Uh, they're part of the Cavan Way, which is part of the Bear Breffney Way, which ends in Black Line and, and, and over to Belcou. And, uh, you know, I, I think that whole area is somewhere that's really under the radar at the moment and has the potential to drive a lot more business for us collectively, um, both sides of the border. So uh, I, I think that's that, that's very good news. We're seeing a lot, um, some private investment um, coming in, which is great to see because it, it, it under, it underscores the confidence in both the brand and the region as well. When when you see you know private businesses investing at this time, you know during COVID and even pre-COVID, um, into the region, Cabo by the lakes there on the left-hand side. That's overlooking uh, where we saw the canoers earlier in Killykeen Forest Park. And um, they were old Quilcha cabins that were built during the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. They were abandoned for a few years and a private company came in, refurbished them, and now they're high-end um, uh, luxury cabins. Um, we, we've also got investment going into the likes of um, 
Glasson Lake House. It was recently bought by, um, it was previously known as the Glasson Golf and Country Club, just outside Athlone uh, on the shores of Loch Ree. And it was purchased recently and there's a 20 million euro investment going in there now at the moment um, by the Press Up Group, who, who, are, who are a group that own uh, quite a few properties in Dublin mainly um, and elsewhere also. So, you know, the, seeing, seeing the confidence um, in, the, in, in the private sector to invest in, um, in these properties is really great. New investment also on the other side of the lake um, from Glasson at U Point in Hudson Bay. There's also uh, there's already a, a very successful hotel at Hudson Bay and it's where Bay Sports is located, that inflatable water park. But, but the Hudson Bay Group have, have um, purchased U Point um, and there, which is this peninsula in the picture that extends out into Loch Ree. And they're looking at the moment um, it's, it's it's sort of a uh, it's just been purchased. They haven't decided fully yet on, on what the kind of the experience mix is that's going to go in there, but it's going to be something based on on, on ecotourism, and um, it, again a very confident um, investment. So st stepping back from all that and, and and the individual experiences, just want to talk for a couple of minutes as to the approach we're taking uh, in developing the entire region. So um, as a development authority, our job is to uh, obviously you know we're there for the businesses. Um, our success is determined by whether the businesses are are successful, and uh, but we don't see all destinations as as being at at the same stage in development. And this is a very common. Um, it was, uh, I think, it's the Butler model of of uh, of destination maturity. We've we've changed the wording on it to kind of suit ourselves because we think that there are four stages generally of of uh, of destination development. It starts off by being an aspiring destination. It, it, it goes on to be a pioneering destination where you get a lot of first movers doing doing new and exciting stuff in a destination. It goes on to you know to progress uh, uh, then on to um, you know becoming quite established, and then you're looking at 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 at, at, um, at enhancing after that. So there are kind of four four levels of destination maturity, and at that stage then a destination you know over a long period of time a destination will then either go into decline or will find its second curve. And uh, and find that that uh, rejuvenation um, curve and uh, and reinvent itself in some way for a new market or you know um, put a new spin on things. And um, so where we think the hidden heartlands are around about here, we think that there uh, that there are a number of areas that are you know not traditional tourism destinations at all. They're in in, in the aspiring space, but for the area around around the Shannon in particular and that Shannon corridor. Uh, which is really important. We we think they're they're roundabout, you know, kind of pioneering. So kind of level two of a four of of, of a four level scale, if you want to put it that way. Um, we have mapped kind of product within the area. Um, the accommodation um, is the one on the left. The activity providers is the one in the middle, and the attractions, the visitor attractions, is the one on the right. So we kind of major on on the outdoor activities side of things when you when, when you look at those pictures. But you can see emerging from it three distinct clusters within the region, and we've we, we've tended to organise ourselves around those clusters as a result. So the the, the area on the northern that that northern red bit is. Um, is centered around Carrick and Shannon uh, on the left hand side and, and Cavan Town on the right hand side, which are the main um, hubs for accommodation. And then at Lone is the one in the middle and then Loch Derg he heading into Limerick uh, is the one on the, on the southern end. So we took these as our, as our uh, those kind of three broad areas as our template and we divided the, the, the region up into those kind of three destinations. And that was important from a business point of view because we established a number of, of, of new networks um, around those three areas. Um, before that, any, any business networks that existed were uh, existed on a county basis. And that's fine generally um, when you've got, you know, when most of your product and most of your, your, your um, experiences are within one county. But because the Shannon is not only the provincial boundary, but also the county boundary, and most tourism is centered around the Shannon, if you draw a radius from Athlone Town, for example, of 15 kilometres, you're, you're into four counties. If you draw a radius around Carrick and Shannon, uh, which is our other main hub on the northern end, end of 15 kilometres or so, you're, you're into three counties. Um, and again, you know, Loch Derg on the southern end, you've got three counties bordering Loch Derg. So we very quickly needed to establish uh, at the start cross county networks. So encouraging businesses to partner and um, to collaborate um, and to cross-promote 
businesses that weren't just in their own county, but that were in their, their destination. So we were taking kind of a visitor centric focus um, on, on all of this. And, and rather than just looking at it from a county perspective, we wanted to look at it from, from a destination perspective. And uh, we created three new um, uh, uh, networks, which, which I'll talk about again in a few minutes. So the, the, this slide is just giving you an overview as, as to the facts and figures really, and what kind of visitor numbers we're generating at the moment. So these are figures from 2019, which are, is our last you know, proper year of, of trading really before COVID hit. So we were in around the 500 or 450,000 overseas visitors generating around 178 million and um, around 784,000 uh, domestic visitors generating about 129 million. Northern Ireland is a very important market for us. Um, I think in general, you know, visitors from Northern Ireland that visit the Republic, 50% of them don't go further than the border counties on, on the on, on, on the Republic side. Um, and then 50% go go further than that. So for the likes of Cavan um, and uh, and Leitrim in um, in Hidden Heartlands, the, the Northern Ireland market is very, very important. So in 2019, we had 120,000 visitors generating 34 million. Um, and uh, we also know, you know, what they came for. So about 50% of our visitors are holiday makers. A, a whopping 39% really are visiting friends and, and, and family. And that's an underrated, undervalued um, and very often overlooked segment of the market. That's very important for us. And um, they tend to stay longer. So the average stay for visiting friends and relatives is five to six nights, whereas for a holiday maker, it's two to three nights. And while there's while they might be staying with family and friends, um, and not staying, not not always staying in visitor accommodation. They do tend to spend money with within the region in restaurants, uh, bars, cafes, and also visitor attractions. And if you're visiting a, a friend or relative, you often force that friend or relative out to visit, you know, sites and attractions that they that were that were have been on the doorstep for years and they might take for granted. So again, it's very it's 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 a very important market, but we need a differentiated approach to market to them. And that's something that we're that we're looking at closely as well. So they're just some of the facts and figures. And um, just, just looking at any destination, and, and this is kind of granny and suck and egg stuff for you guys. I mean, you you know all this already, but to, the, the, the purpose of this slide is, is just, you know, for us to understand as well ourselves how multifaceted and complex any one destination is that it's made up of all of these different elements and, and, and parts and no one player has a control over any one of and over all of those parts. So it just un, underpins and underwrites the importance of um, of collaboration and partnership and for, forging a really strong coalition of, of, of players going forward, both public and private sector, because it's only by working together can we, you know, improve all of these different touch points. So if we want to improve a destination, you've got to improve each of those things uh, separately. So, you know, visitor experiences, safety, business tours and facilities, signage and orientation, access and transport, uh, managed public realm, festivals and events, retail, food and drink, all of those things have, um, uh, aggregate up to making um, uh, a high quality and distinctive destination. Uh, so th this is just coming back to our our, our maturity model. Um, I, I won't dwell on this because I've already touched on it, but it's just our, our four levels of aspiring, pioneering, progressing and enhancing. And the, the, the point is that if you're trying to work with a particular destination that's at the pioneering level at the moment, the interventions and the, the investment and the initiatives needed for that are going to be different than ones that you would you you would you would be requiring for uh, for a level four destination, one that's at at the enhancing stage, and it ju it just really makes the point that it's not a one size fits all solution. That the that that, that if you're trying to move um, a uh, if you're trying to move a destination along that maturity curve, um, you've got to be cognizant of where it's at at the moment and what the, what, what its particular needs are. So um, at the moment, a lot of the hidden heartlands destinations are at the pioneering stage where we're seeing an emerging domestic market recognition. Uh, we need a clear, clear USP and a clear, a clear strategy. There's a lot of core product development to be done and um, a lot of converting, you know, raw assets into visitor experiences as well and enhancing the industry capability also. So a lot of our initiatives over the last couple of years have been focused on, on, on that. 
and um, we're we're putting together a strategy at the moment for the next five years for hidden heartlands and one of the one of the um, areas is coming up with, with a strong vision so i mean i i won't go through this now but it's in the slides and i'm, I'm sure karen will circulate the slides late, um, later on but it's it's really trying to say you know the vision is saying right it's, it's 2030 what would how would we like to be describing the hidden heartlands at 2030 and then okay. let's, let's work back from that so if if we're seeing you know what what are our challenges and um, the, the probably single biggest challenge we have um, in hidden heartlands is one of increasing domestic and international awareness and consideration of Ireland's hidden heartlands as a distinctive region and then supporting the industry to fully leverage the abundance of available and natural cultural assets to develop compelling visitor experiences so ones that will draw visitors into the region in their own right uh, resulting obviously in increased visitor revenue and local jobs by protecting the unique environment of the region. So that translates into, and we've, we we use the VICE model, which is an acronym for Visitor Industry Community Environment, and um, it's, it's a model of sustainable tourism. So we don't want to uh, to grow numbers at the expense of you know of, of community or of environment. So it's about get, getting that balance across all four and in, in, in the in the shadow of, 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 of COP26 and you know what's what, what what's happening there with uh, with climate change and, and the government has declared um you know climate and biodiversity emergencies now we need to be really conscious of that also but we can use that as an opportunity because we have ecotourism as a, as a serious opportunity um uh, for for, for, for growing tourism within the region in a sustainable way. So in terms of visitor, what we want to do is increase year on year the levels of awareness of, of Ireland's hidden heartlands. We're at about 40% we're, we're recognition among the, the domestic visitor at the moment of the brand, which is pretty good um, for, for being three years old. And we want to establish a much stronger domestic base, even from a sustainability point of view, domestic is very, very good, but also having had the opportunity, you know, in, in every crisis, there's an opportunity in the crisis over the last couple of years, the opportunity presented to us is to is to introduce the domestic visitor to what's on offer here and hopefully build those um, uh, or to convert those first timers then into repeat visits um, over over the years to come. In terms of the industry objectives, it's achieving a balance uh, and sustainable revenue growth through the development of quality visitor experiences that motivate the visitors in, in, into the region and believe, building the commercial capacity and capability of the industry as well. From the community side, we want to make sure that we, you know, deliver those socioeconomic benefits for communities. Really jobs is, 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 is what, what it's all about. You know, we want to give local people, um, you know, we want tourism to be a reason why they don't have to leave and go somewhere else. Um, why they can stay and live and work in, in their in their local area. Um, and from an environmental perspective, the first environmental principle is do no harm. We want to protect and enhance the natural environment in Hidden Heartlands as a primary tourism asset, but also establish the region as a leading European sustainable tourism and eco destination. So one, one of the first actions we took at Waterways Ireland was the preparation of a Shannon Tourism Master Plan, which was launched earlier this year, and that provides a roadmap for the for the for, for, for the Shannon Corridor. Um, it's got it's got a price tag on it of about 70 million. Um, hopefully we will find that somewhere over the 10 years of, of the of the plan, 78 million, I think it is. And it's got a number of very specific actions in there that we've already begun to invest in. So the Shannon Pot, for example, that that, that, that bit of investment was one of the actions within the Shannon Tourism Master Plan. So um, I, I, I won't dwell on this, but I mean, it's, it's, it's available online on, on the Waterways Ireland website for you to for you to see and the six you know general strategic initiatives. Really, it's trying to get, I mean, you know, 20, 30 years ago, there were probably 600 rental boats um, on the Shannon. Now there's uh, just a little over 200. So it, it, it's 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 an area that that has um, it's a sector that has decreased over over the last 20 years, um, for a variety of of, of reasons. And um, but we see an opportunity to grow that again. And generally, the the, the cruise rental market would be 70% international um, and about 25, 30% domestic. Last year and the year before, they were booked out fully 100% domestic. So again, visitors had seen that as something that was just for the tourists, whereas now they're seeing it as a great experience that they should be partaking in as well. So hopefully we can we can build um, uh, um, loyalty around that as well. The, the Bear Brefney Way, as I mentioned, is this very long uh, walking route which is being developed at the moment. It's, it, it, it was, it's probably the single biggest community development project in tourism that's ever happened um, in, in, in the country, led by a guy called Jim O'Sullivan from Cork. 
Um, but this year we've invested 400,000 in, in a plan to, to, to finish it off really, to bring it up to National Trails Office standard. Um, and hopefully that will happen over the over the coming years. As I said earlier, one of the most important things that, that we've been doing over the last while is building strong networks of businesses. Um, you know, it, 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 a visitor destination at an early stage of development doesn't generally exhibit strong networks. And it, it's brilliant to see this particular initiative that we're, that, that we're in on today, the, 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 the Friday FAM. Uh, that's such a good initiative um, and I'd really encourage you to kind of keep, keep keep going with that because that's what we need to be doing more as well. So we've, we've, um, we've established these three cross-county commercially focused um, networks, uh, about 25 businesses at the moment in, in each of three networks. So we're working about 75 businesses across the region and, and, and we, we have an ongoing development program in place with them really around uh, encouraging cross selling and, and cross promotion. One of the things that we one of the first things we, we did in the region when, when, we, when we got into place was we spent uh, 1 million euro on improving the websites of about 40 businesses. And uh, we did this because the digital shop window for Hidden Heartlands was pretty poor um, two years ago. When we went into the region and say, if I was a visitor, you know, doing a Google search online, what comes up when I look for things to see and do within this region? And to be honest, it was it was embarrassingly poor. So we said, look, the first thing we got to do is is improve the digital shop window for those for 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 the region for existing businesses. So we got forty businesses on board. Um, the hotels were already pretty good, so we didn't involve them in this scheme because they all have online booking, but we did involve 40 experienced providers, so visitor attractions and, um, and activity providers. And we went from having 15% online booking to 90% online booking by the end of the scheme with, with significantly improved content as well. Um, this is the website for the Irish Boat Rental Association, which is the kind of um, the, the umbrella body for the, for, for the boat rental. They had a pretty poor website. This is their new website now, and this is just a, you know a host of other websites. But one thing we asked them all to do, and we made it a condition of the grant, was they all had to carry a Hidden Heartlands uh, section on their websites, which promoted other businesses as well. So you can see these are this is a sample of the um, of, of the kind of content that's across uh, four four different websites, uh, all promoting one another, all a similar look and feel in terms of the of, of the Hidden Heartlands content, and we provided a lot of content for them. So the, the, the videos and the photography we, we uh, provided for them as well. So there's now 40 businesses that are doing this to a very high level. And in terms of general industry, industry supports um, over, over the next year in particular, and well, a couple of years really, um, Sur Survive to Thrive is actually, you know, is, is, is very obviously crucial and um, getting businesses over the hump of COVID um, and back into thriving again. So the business continuity support scheme and other financial supports are, 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 are there also. Network and cluster development is absolutely crucial. Um, there's a range of national support programs as well and saleable experiences as well. So working with the Irish based inbound agents and Tourism Ireland to continually bring them new news about hidden heartlands and about new experiences and products that we have is, re is, is, a, is, is a really important part of what we do as well. We, we, uh, we have an annual marketing campaign as well, which for, for last year and the year before what, what was it was uh, the, the tagline was make a break for it. So I just want to before I finish up, I just want to share the ad that we ran um, this year on TV for Hidden Heartlands, which just gives a kind of a, a, a flavour of, of the offering as well. So I'm not sure if the sound is going to come through in this anyway, but you'll get the picture at least. No, that failed. So <laughs> I, I think I've got bad network quality here. So I just leave that there. Um, I'll, I'll circulate the link anyway, but it's, it's just, uh, here we are again. Give it one more go. Okay, so that's me. Um, happy to happy to take any any questions on that. Sorry, I know I've run over time and probably. Um, okay, thanks. Into your afternoon. Sorry for that.
Thanks very much for that, uh, Patty. I think we may have a, a minute or two if anyone does have any quick questions to ask at this, at this point. Can you raise your hands? No, I think uh, I think you're I think you're off the hook, Patty, this time. Are you OK? <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Well, uh, Karen has a, has a PDF of the of the presentation anyway, so I'm happy for that to be yeah. shared. Okay. I will share it because I suppose the, the, a lot of the information there is um, so relevant in terms of what we're doing here locally as well. So it's really um, good to have that insight, Patty. So thank you very much for, okay, for coming along today. It'll be resonating with people uh, right throughout the room. So <laughs> that's good to see that, you know, uh, what's happening down there as well. So that's great. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thanks again. And uh, I think we have a few dates uh, for, for your diary coming up. I don't know if you want me to read that out, Karen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I can try and share my screen, folks. I suppose it's just yes, um, in terms of um, a few things that are coming up that will be of interest to yourselves. Um, can you see my screen there, okay, folks? Yeah. Okay, so um, I suppose just a few um, tourism and I business support programs. Um, there is a sustainable tourism webinar next Thursday, and um, you do need to pre register, but I suppose. Um, you know, we, we've heard it across the board and then um, Patty has just re reiterated the importance of sustainable tourism. So um, it would be a good opportunity for anyone who's um, interested in looking at that. That's next Thursday. Um, and then next Friday the 19th is the deadline for the COVID recovery kickstart program. Um, that, ha that deadline was extended from today. So there is an opportunity for, um, for you still to make that application if, uh, if you wish. Um, also, just to let you know that we will be, um, from a council perspective, we will be running a um, series of webinars now um, in the coming weeks uh, around creating demand generating experiences. And um, it will be led by Lisa um, Johnson from the Forum, um, who has a wealth of knowledge in terms of working with clusters, collaborations, and of course, um, creating saleable experiences. So the dates are there. We will circulate um, uh, some registration um, details. Um, early next week um, and as those are three different elements it's around creating experiences themselves looking at route to market and how to price your experience um, and I suppose Patty mentioned it there as well it's around that you know visitor centric approach and, and you know creating these for the visitor um, and looking at price points as your visitor is willing to pay and things like that there so it's opening your mind to that and then final session we'll be looking at your brand um, and the, the destination brand and um, again Terry referenced it during um, his talk and Tanya picked up on it around that destination first message and um, how you link your brand with that um, in terms of marketing collateral to um, sell your experience so um, a very important and very um, current um, issue so that series will be running over the next couple of weeks. Um, and we'll, as I say, we'll share det more details early next week. Um, <clears throat> Tanya um, and Louise, um, in terms of the attractions form, I know this is for um, FLT members, but again, we've um, we've talked about it earlier on in today's session about the importance of this connection and knowing what attractions are there and what people are doing and how they're learning and how we've had to um, reevaluate what we're doing and things like that. But all that learnings and experience is there. So there is a session for members of the attractions form, um, and anyone who has. If you're part of that, you can contact Tanya or Louise, or if you want to um, understand more about that. But there is a session on Friday, the 3rd of December. For anyone who's operating in that um, area, I would certainly recommend you attend that session. Um, so that's really it from um, from myself. Um, OK, stop I'm here again. Well, look, thanks very much. And thanks uh, to our speakers today, our guest speaker. And thank you, thank you to everybody who's joined in. I hope it was very informative for you and it, uh, we can take something away from that and make uh, it even a bigger tourist destination. Um, it's just a, a final positive note from myself. Uh, the bad weather is going, so you're going to have a nice week <laughs> weekend. So uh, it's sunny, it'll be dry. So hopefully you'll get outdoors and do a bit of exploring around the area and, and ha have a good weekend, everyone.